In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Ghost, Amen. So, uh, it was the Feast of the Sacred Heart last Friday, and we had uh, the, there was the ordinations in Winona. Please pray for the priests, the new priests. And uh, about this Feast of the Sacred Heart, we have to uh, remember that the Sacred Heart is a talking to us. The Sacred Heart is talking to us through his priests. It is the duty of the priest to be the mouthpiece of the Sacred Heart. It is the duty of the priest to meditate about this sacred heart, to contemplate this sacred heart. And what does he see? He sees that the sacred heart has been wounded. He sees that the sight of our Lord has been wounded and the wound has never been closed. So the wounds of our Lord, also those of his hands and feet, are like mouths proclaiming a truth. And what is this truth that the wounds of our Lord proclaim? It is his infinite love for us. It is his zeal for the salvation of sinners. And it is his will that those to whom he has given the great privilege of participating in his priesthood, his divine priesthood, it is his will that those would continue his presence and his action on earth, especially that of preaching and teaching. The lips of the priest should open in order to help the souls being saved, the souls knowing better our Lord and better their duties and therefore being saved. And this is why the priest has to have a strong spiritual life because you cannot give what you don't have. And the Sacred Heart wants his priest to know him in order to give him to the people. And the sacrament of holy orders has a special effect on the soul of the priest. It urges him to be the instrument of our Lord. There is a special emotion that uh, we do feel. And we do feel that at some times we have to talk uh, a bit more strongly maybe than usual. Uh, that is why two weeks ago on June the 3rd uh, I gave you that sermon but it was not my personal opinion that I was expressing. I was expressing the teaching of the society and this is what you expect me to give you. And uh, on that day, uh, I answered to four arguments that uh, were presented and are still presented by some people uh, in favor of an agreement, a practical agreement with Rome, uh, without Rome having to correct our errors. We always in the society, and as far as I know, Officially, this is a still our policy. I have not seen any document that said that we have changed. I have not seen any declaration, official declaration, from the superior saying that this has changed. And it was very clear in the general chapter of 2006 and the extraordinary chapter of 2008 that this was our policy, that we would not sign an agreement with Rome unless uh, Rome would correct at least the main errors of the Council. 
and this is officially still the position. But because there were so many uh, bits and pieces of people talking or writing on the internet, um, there was those arguments that I thought I had to uh, correct and to give the answer to them from the official teaching of the society. So that's why uh, these four arguments that we had was the, we answered was that there was a change. There had been a change in Rome. So we, we have shown that this was not true. Uh, the second one was that we could interpret the documents of the council uh, with a hermeneutic of continuity. It is to say to interpret them in the light of tradition. We saw that they don't have the same definition about tradition. And we saw that there was a group of documents that cannot be interpreted rightly. They have to be corrected. Uh, that's the third group. Um, and uh, the other argument was that we would continue the fight and we would not be corrupted by the errors surrounding us in the modern church, and we saw that this was wrong as well. And the final argument that we saw uh, was that we would have a greater field of apostolate, and we saw that this was not true either. So we have seen these four arguments, and they have been answered by the book, The Catechism of the Crisis in the Church. Now, some of you uh, have asked me for my notes of uh, this uh, sermon. So I cannot give you my notes, but uh, you can still have access to that sermon. Uh, somebody sent me an email, told me it was on the YouTube, and it's true. Uh, so it's on the internet. So basically, you just have to type SSPX crisis and you will have not only mine but many others okay good sermons too uh, so and then if you think that you know I mean it's just a book I was just reading the book so if you don't have that book you know then you can listen to the sermon again and I hope you have ordered it if you don't have it um, Vernon almost everybody ordered the book I did that sermon last week and, uh, and you can give it to some friends because people, uh, unfortunately, with all those arguments, um, have uh, started to be confused about what is the rule that we have to follow and what are the principles of the society and so forth and so on. So, as I say, as far as I know, the official doctrine of the society is no argument without Rome. Uh, correcting the main errors, at least, of Vatican II. But there are four other arguments that are going around. And uh, I would like to talk to them. One of them said that, well, you know, we have to do like in the history of the church when there was a crisis, work it out in the same way, and so forth and so on. Second argument was that some of the bishops uh, are pretty good towards tradition. They are pretty traditional. Um, another argument was, well, we have to be part of the visible church. If we remain outside the visible church, it's not good. And the fourth argument is, if we remain outside the visible church, then there is a danger that we will be in a true schism. So... Uh, I made lots of research this week, but I found the book, um, another book from Archbishop Lefebvre, and it's still sold in the Angelus. It's a small book, 90 pages, and it's actually very good. Uh, it's uh, by Archbishop Lefebvre. It's called The Spiritual Journey. And in this book, he gives us uh, a summary of the Catholic teaching about uh, God, the creation of man, the angels, Adam and Eve, the church, uh, the sacraments, the priesthood, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, it's very, very good to read this. And at the same time, he um, shows how these different teachings of the church um, have been contradicted 
by Vatican II and the reform, so-called reforms that followed. And uh, therefore, it's a very good book. And, uh, but uh, I'm warning you, I'm warning all of you, uh, the Archbishop was not a softy. He was not the kind of guy for hugging and kissing, especially not the enemies of the church. So what he is going to say is a strong. So the faint of art, uh, you better be warned. If there is any among you, which I am sure there isn't. So, uh, therefore, before to uh, continue this on this point, we have to keep in mind that what you are going to hear about the Arch from the Archbishop's lips is relevant to what I said at the beginning today, that it comes from not only his great theological knowledge, but his contemplation of the Sacred Heart. And because he loved Christ the King so much, because he loved the Sacred Heart so much, that's why he had so great a zeal, a zeal for the salvation of souls, and a hatred for everything that is an obstacle to this salvation. And in this, he imitates our Lord, and you know that our Lord, one of the figures of our Lord was King David. And uh, you all know the story of David and Goliath, but I'm not going to talk about this. But King David, before to become a king, he was a shepherd. And he told uh, King Saul what happened twice when he was guarding his sheep. The first time, at some point, a lion came and ravished one of his sheep and went away. Another time, it was a bear, same thing. Ravished one of the sheep, put it in his mouth, walk away. Now, what did David do when he saw that? Most of us, uh, maybe we would have fled or go for a weapon or something. Uh, no, he ran after the lion, and then he ran after the bear, which must have surprised both of them. He ran after them, caught up with them, and then, I guess, punched them on the nose or something, wrestled the sheep from their mouth, opening the mouth and wrestled the sheep, went back home. Um, so I think that was the, the last they heard of, the, of them, the bear and the lion, after that lesson that he taught them. But to show you his zeal, you know, this goes with the gospel of today. The woman who lost her, her money and uh, the man who lost his sheep. To which extent our Lord would go to snatch from the jaws of the devil, the souls that he tries to bring to hell. And he went up to the cross to, he offered his own death. And Archbishop Lefebvre imitated him and imitated David. And that's why he has a strong language, because he understands the evil of error. Because he knew, and this is Catholic dogma, that you cannot be saved. And our Lord himself said so. Unless by knowing him and loving him, being in the state of grace, being baptized. And so, if these words seem to you strong, they come from his love for souls. His great... Uh, zeal for their salvation. So let's go with these uh, arguments. So the first argument that I want to talk about today is that we have to be realistic. We cannot wait until 
uh, the church converts. That would take too much time. And uh, we have to try to work something out with them. And uh, so-called that uh, apparently that's what St. Basil, Basil did uh, in the beginning of the church. But this actually was answered by Mons. Bishop Tissier, the Malheret himself, on June the 3rd. Okay, that sermon, there's an English translation of that sermon. He preached that in Saint Nicolas du Chardonnay in Paris. So that's a big church. That's our biggest church and biggest parish. And so he preached uh, against uh, a practical agreement and he preached against this error of uh, historical error that was being diffused. Uh, but the, there's another answer too is that the crisis we are living today is the first one in history that the church has lived. There was no other, there were big crises before, but there was no crisis as grave as the one we live today. Because there was no other crisis where the five popes for 50 years and all the machinery, all the, uh, the administrative parts of the church have been intent into making a revolution in the Catholic Church, into changing the church according to the principle of Freemasonry and French Revolution. We saw that two weeks ago. And so what does the Archbishop say about this. I quote from the book uh, with the Roman number 8. That's the page. These conciliar Roman authorities cannot but oppose savagely and violently any reaffirmation of the traditional magisterium. The errors of the council and its reforms remain the official standard consecrated by the profession of faith of Cardinal Ratzinger in March 1989. So this book was published in 1991. The first publication was, I think, 1990 in French. So that's very strong. And then he's, uh, after that, he talks about the history of the society, how it came about, uh, and the history of the council. And for him, it was a mystery that there was not more than two bishops in the whole world who would stand up and fight. Quote, but the mystery is that there were not 50 or 100 bishops to act as Bishop de Castro Meyer and myself did as true successors of the apostles against impostors, against impostors. An impostor is somebody who pretends to be what he is not. It is not pride and self-importance to say that God in his merciful wisdom saved the heritage of his priesthood, of his grace, of his revelation through these two bishops. Where would we be if these two would not have stood up? We would not be here. We would probably not have the faith. It is not we who chose ourselves, but God has guided us in the upholding of all the riches of his incarnation and of his redemption. Those who feel they must minimize these riches and deny them can only condemn us. This can only confirm their schism with our Lord and his kingdom by means of their secularism and their apostate ecumenism. Apostate means when you reject the faith. So those are strong words. It is them who abandon uh, our Lord and His kingdom. Okay, so that shows you that this um, 
crisis we live today, there was no other the same in history. Another uh, argument, the second argument we hear sometimes is, well, you know, uh, now we can see that there are some good cardinals, there are some good bishops uh, who want to promote uh, tradition, you know, but they are afraid to do too much, you know, publicly, so forth and so on. So uh, there's an answer to that already, is that it's the same kind of lies that I heard for the last 32 years. And you probably heard them too, okay? It's just a means to try to make us believe that, oh yeah, Rome is converting. That's not true, okay? Uh, uh, answer from uh, Archbishop, page 9, Ro uh, Roman numerals. I can hear them say, you exaggerate. There are many good bishops who pray, who have the faith, who are edifying. His answer to that. Were they saints? As soon as they accept the false religious liberty, hence the secular state, the false ecumenism, and hence the admission of many ways of salvation, of liturgical reform, and hence of the practical negation of the sacrifice of the Mass, of the new catechisms with all their errors and heresies, they officially contribute to the revolution within the Church and to its destruction. It's what they called in France and other countries during the war, a collaborator. Those who said, well, I will, I will help the Germans, but in fact, I'm with you guys. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not for the Germans. I'm really with you, but I'm going to help uh, our country better if I am uh, working in sight. It's the same kind of, of lie. Okay, so we have done already the two first arguments. The third argument, oh yeah, that oh, we need to be... Uh, go back to the visible church. So let's see what he says about the church. First, what is the church? What are we talking about? When, when we say, oh, we have to be part of the visible church, well, my question is, which one? Which church are you talking about? The church considered as, that's page 53, the church considered as mystical body is a spiritual reality comprising all the souls and angels who live of the divine life communicated by our Lord. Communicated by our Lord. They are as living branches attached to the vine. During this earthly life, Alice, many can detach themselves from the vine and perish. Others, to the contrary, are grafted onto the vine by a valid and fruitful baptism, and then they live by it. At the same time, this body, this mystical body, which is mystical and invisible for us, because we cannot see uh, the souls, we cannot see if they are in the state of grace or not, or if they have been baptized, we, we, we cannot see the souls. But at the same time, this mystical body presents itself here below as a visible, hierarchical society founded by our Lord for the purpose of augmenting the mystical body according to the command given to the apostles by our Lord. Going, therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Ghost. And another quote, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Well, I told you last time about these exceptions to that, that some people of goodwill, sometimes God can give them a direct grace. And, uh, and they can become part of the church uh, that way okay but the problem is it's difficult in when you are atheist or you are uh, in a false religion to live correctly but it could happen okay that's the teaching of the church 
The final goal of salvation is linked to the faith. The whole hierarchy was instituted by our Lord in service of the faith. So yes, it is a hierarchical society, but the whole purpose of the hierarchy is to work for the salvation of souls, for the propagation of the faith, for the right and uh, beautiful worship of God in the liturgy, for the sanctification of the religious and the priests, and so forth and so on. For all the doctrine, the, the true doctrine. So that's the goal of the hierarchy. That's why they, they've been given so many graces. The old hierarchy, hierarchy was instituted by our Lord in service of the faith, which faith then permits the faithful to drink from the sources of charity, of the Holy Ghost, and of His grace. The entire history of the primitive church is an illustration instructing us of the importance of the comments given by our Lord. So, this is the purpose of the hierarchy. Now, that's the visible Catholic Church. The visible Catholic Church, the society with hierarchy working for the faith. That's the visible Catholic Church. Those bishops, Pope and bishops, who work for the salvation of soul, who work for the propagation of the faith, for the kingdom of Christ. But what do we have now? It is precisely this we have observed for many decades and which has led to the self-destruction of the church. According to the word of Paul VI himself, a de himself a decisive collaborator in this self-destruction. Thus, in spite of the promises of our law, which in truth do not cease to be fulfilled, the majority of the church authorities prevaricate with false modern gods by ecumenism. We are on page 46. These false modern gods are not only those worshipped by false religions, but also the false deified ideologies. That is to say, the goddess reason, the goddess liberty, and the goddesses democracy, socialism, and communism. God, Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church, the Holy Sacrifice of the Cross and of the Mass, and the true Catholic priesthood are not ecumenical. Because they proclaim a credo and, a practi and they practice an anti-ecumenical law. They work towards the universal reign of Christ the King, of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ crucified. So there is a complete contradiction between the, Catholic, the visible Catholic Church working for the kingdom of Christ the King and the ecumenical modernist conciliar church who are favoring errors and heresies and therefore they are working against the salvation of souls. He continues, the current Pope and bishops, well, that was John Paul II, but it's even worse with Benedict XVI as we have seen last week, uh, two weeks ago. The current Pope and bishops no longer hand down our Lord Jesus Christ, but rather a sentimental, superficial, charismatic religiosity through which, as a general rule, the true grace of the Holy Ghost no longer passes. This new religion is not the Catholic religion. It is sterile, incapable of sanctifying society and the family. I repeat, this new religion is not the Catholic religion. 
it's clear. I mean, if the if the saints would come back and they would visit the different churches, in which church would they recognize uh, being their Catholic church? It will be the traditional church without compromise. The others, uh, they just want to have their liturgy and they have compromised. They have done like the, those collaborators during the war. Leave me in peace and I will not trouble your enterprise of destruction of the church. They will have to answer for it. They will have to answer for it. And uh, the, the last uh, quote about uh, this question of the two different churches. That's why I said at the beginning, visible church, which one? Because there are two, two different religions. It's a new religion they started. The evil of the council is the ignorance of Jesus Christ and of his kingdom. It is the evil of the bad angels. The evil which is the way to hell. It's basically those modernists are just repeating the revolt, the first revolt of Lucifer against the incarnation of Christ. And the last argument that we want to answer today is the question, oh yes, if we don't reconcile with Rome, if we take too much time to do that, at the end there is a danger that we will enter into a true schism, a true separation from the Catholic Church. So... The answer is in page 54. So he, he talks first about how the church came to be and how the church is the new Israel, of the, the Israel of the New Testament. Having the incarnate word at, as its head. Remember that the chief of the church is our Lord. It is him who directs and guides and gives the power. Just, and I quote uh, the Archbishop, just as the Israel of the Old Testament had a troubled history because of continuous infidelities towards God, which were often the works of its leaders and its Levites, so does the church militant in this world know without end periods of trial on account of the infidelity of its clerics and their compromises with the world. The higher they come from, the more scandals provoke disasters. Certainly, the church itself guards its sanctity and its sources of sanctification. It is, even if the devil tried to crush the church, to make a revolution in the church, it did, for most of it, it created a parallel church with its own new code of canon law, its own new ecumenical Bible, the new mass, uh, the new ritual of blessing, the new ritual of exorcisms, uh, and so forth and so on. Everything new. Like we turn from the past. We don't like the past anymore. It has to be new. It has to come from us. There's a lot of pride there. There's an immense pride. To say that for 2,000 years, well, that was no good. And I'm the Pope, I'm going to have a new thing, everything new. Just watch me. Just watch me, I can do so many things. And he did. I'm pretty sure that where he is now, he needs a good fan. So the higher they come from, the world. But the control of its institutions of the church by unfaithful popes, unfaithful popes and apostate bishops ruins the faith of the faithful and the clergy. We just have to open our eyes. Look outside. Look at all those parishes. People don't go anymore. They have to sell them. 
They, they have to even uh, eliminate dioceses. Uh, in uh, Newfoundland about uh, seven, eight years ago, they, got, they put, there was four dioceses. They transformed them into one because there's not enough priests, there's not enough people. They have to close the parishes, you know that. The apostate bishops ruins the faith of the faithful and the clergy, sterilizes the instruments of grace, and favors the assault of all the powers of hell, which, seems, which seem to triumph. Now listen to this, because this is very important. This apostasy makes its members adulterers, schismatics opposed to tradition, separated from the past of the church, and thus separated from the church of today. In the measure that it remains faithful to the church of our Lord. Everyone who remains faithful to the true church is the object of savage and continuous persecution. So I repeat that, that sentence. This apostasy makes its members adulterers, schismatics, opposed to all tradition, separated from the past of the church and thus separated from the church of today. Because the Catholic church, there is no such thing as the church of the past, the church of today. The church of today is the church of the past. There is no discontinuity between them. You and I and the four faithful bishops, we live in the church of today, the Catholic church of today, the Catholic church of 2012, and yet it is the same church uh, than the church of the past. It's the same church. It's not because your mother, uh, you know, you, you, I don't know, you go on a trip, on a long trip, your mother is 40. You come back, she's 45 or 50. Okay? That's your mother of today. She's 50. But it's the same mother than your mother when she was 40. The same thing. So what happened to them is that they are uh, schismatics opposed to all tradition. They are separated from the past of the church and therefore they are separated from the church of today. The schism, oh, if we don't join them, uh, we're going to be in schism. They are in schism. They are the one who should ask me for an agreement. Not me, but let's say the superiors of the society. They should come to the superiors of the society and say, you know what? We really are sorry. We realize, it's mathematic, we just realize that people have lost their faith and people don't come to Mass. And it's a ruin. And it's a disaster. And now we realize that this council was evil and we regret and we're going to uh, uh, throw it in the garbage. We're going to, uh, you know, give it to a recycling company. They'll do something of a better use with all those documents and books, modern books, than uh, for reading. And then they would come and uh, they would say, that's right, we finished all those shenanigans. That's over. We don't do ICC no more. We don't do the World Youth Day no more. Okay? We go back to the confessional as used to be. We don't do the new mass no more. We do the traditional mass. We get away with all those new catechisms and new Bibles and all that. Because we see the bad fruits. Hey, we would go on our knees and we would kiss the feet of the Pope. I would do it. I would kiss the feet of the Pope and I would say, thank God. Thank God we, our Pope has come back to the church. He's like in exile now in a cold country. 
a strange land. He is in a kind of a sleepwalking, uh, you know, in a, I'm talking about in the matter of the faith. He knows what he's doing, but he's... He is the Pope. There's, a, there's no problem. I believe he is the Pope. But he is not doing his job. And so, what should we do? Should we be anxious to solve so-called the problem with a signature on a piece of paper? Or should we just have hope in the power of our Lord and the power of Blessed Virgin Mary? We should have hope. We are not yet in the catacombs. The visible church, that was the church of the catacombs too. The underground church, there was no St. Peter's palace and church and basilica and there was no pope with a white cassock in those days. The mass was celebrated in the houses and when the persecution came, they had to go on the ground. They had to dig on the ground. They had to do the mass and the ceremonies in a cemetery, in an underground cemetery. But that was the visible church still. Because they manifested their faith to the point of giving their blood, giving their lives. So we should have hope because all those saints, all those popes, they see us. They see what's happening. And they pray instantly for the solution of this crisis. But the solution, my dear brethren, we know what it is already. The solution of the crisis of the church is to be found in the books of statistics. It's mathematics that will save us. It's just a matter of years and maybe that's why they, 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 they are so eager to have us join the, the wagon, jump in the wagon. They are dying. It's a corpse. It's a corpse. So it's no use trying to give a blood transfusion to a corpse. And, and it's the mathematics that will wake them up. The, the little part that's still alive will say, well, you know, uh, it's going down and down and down. And uh, soon there, you know, the Pope will say, I'm going to be alone. I won't even have an altar boy to serve my mass. So maybe there's something wrong with the council. That's how it's going to work. We don't have to do anything special but to continue like we did. We are a beacon of hope. If they want tradition, we don't have to go to them. They just have to come to us. And we'll give them tradition. Archbishop Lefebvre, page 55. But we are not the first to be persecuted by false brothers for having kept the faith and tradition. The Martyrology, Martyrology, that's a book where every day we recall all the martyrs and saints of the day. There's a lot. The Martyrology teaches us this every day. The more Holy Church is insulted, the more we must cling to her body and soul, the more we must force ourselves to defend her and to assure her continuity by drawing from her treasures of sanctity to reconstruct Christianity. That's Archbishop Lefebvre, a great, great man. And we have an ally in this, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and I will end here with a quote of the Archbishop about the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Priests. Mary being the mother of the eternal, that's page 57. Mary being the mother of the eternal priest, exercises a particular motherhood 
with respect to all those who participate in Jesus' priesthood. May the Virgin Mary deign to form us into priests in the image of her divine Son. So priests who have a zeal for the salvation of soul and who hate errors. May devotion to Mary be honored in every house and chapel of the society and in all the hearts of all its members. Mary will keep us in the Catholic faith. She is neither liberal nor modernist nor ecumenical. She is impervious to all errors and with even greater reason to heresies and apostasies. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of God, Amen.